The Netherlands is a country claimed from water. Now it seems the water wants it back. Rising sea levels and overflowing rivers are making this low-lying nation increasingly vulnerable to serious floods. When there is no land, there is no country, there is no Netherlands. It's not a matter of saying, let's just abandon the country. We, we cannot do that. Will the Dutch be able to keep the water at bay? Or must they now contemplate the previously unthinkable, allowing the water in? We shouldn't any longer fight against the water, but, but use it and, and give way to it. Just let it come. We can't hold it back anyway. And if it comes, we'll try to make the best of it. Hans Bergmans has a farm near Maastricht on the Dutch-Belgian border. It's been in his family for generations. The farm is on an island in the River Maas, or Meuse, one of the country's five major rivers. In 1993, heavy rainfall caused the river to flood. The results were devastating. Just before Christmas, the mass flooded when the Christmas tree was up. The house was full of fast-running water swirling about. In one day, the water reached up to here, about 60 centimetres. That's how high the water came to in the house. The flood wreaked havoc on the whole Limburg region, destroying homes and livelihoods and cutting off communities for over a week. And sometimes we saw just outside a hovercraft passing by. The Christmas tree was floating. We had a terrible time. We spent eight days like that. It's the kind of experience you couldn't imagine, and we hope it will never happen again. Without an extensive flood defence, the Dutch can't exist. Two-thirds of the population lives below sea level. For hundreds of years, they relied solely on defensive walls or dikes to defend themselves from flooding. Raised embankments crisscross the country. And windmills, so identifiable with the Dutch landscape, were not just for making flour, but for pumping water from the land. Then, in 1953, the North Sea flood caused destruction across northern Europe, especially in the Netherlands. Close to 2,000 people died. It was obvious that sea walls and dikes were not enough. Over the next three decades, the Dutch constructed huge barriers to protect their coastal cities. But 50 years later, the possible impacts of climate change have put the country's flood defences back under the spotlight. Scientist Louise Fresco has advised the Dutch government on preparing for the future. There are two main threats to the Netherlands. One is um, the rising sea level. And the other threat is that as a result of major discharge through the rivers due to high uh, rainfall in the future, we will have more water coming into the country. And the combination of rising sea level and water from the rivers, of course, poses a very uh, clear and present uh, threat. About 30% of the dikes and protections are not entirely up to the standards that we actually agreed on in the past. So we need to enhance the protection and the best way to do that, of course, is to build upon the existing system and add additional protective measures where they are necessary. Sea levels are rising faster than predicted, as much as 1.3 metres by 2100. Rising sea levels combined with greater river flows poses the risk of flooding. 
that risk has now doubled. In a large-scale flood, millions would have to be evacuated to higher ground. If it happened tomorrow, the Netherlands just couldn't cope. Our system is not up to standard to deal with very large quantities of water, especially if they come suddenly. The Dutch government's response is a national water plan, an overhaul of the country's defences costing billions of euros. The initiative is designed also to raise public awareness of the dangers of climate change. Dutch people are not afraid of water. We, we know we, we live below sea level. We do that for centuries. Sometimes uh, it, is, uh, it would be better if the Dutch people were a little bit more afraid of the water because now there, there maybe is the attitude, of course, we will be able to keep uh, uh, the danger outside. And now with this climate change, it really is important to take measures and to really do things. Attention. You should leave the building via the indicated emergency exits. Do not use the elevators. Last year, the government staged a five-day mock evacuation to test the country's readiness for severe flooding. The results were telling. Had this been a real flood event, 4,000 people would have died. I don't want to wait for a disaster. I don't want to wait for a flood before we take measures. I want to prevent disaster because you can understand with so many people living below sea level, when really a flood occurs, it, it will be horrible. It is really something we have to prevent. The Netherlands is in a constant battle to maintain its coastline. The tide creeps ever closer to seaside towns and villages. To strengthen beaches and dunes and protect communities, millions of cubic tons of sand are dredged from the seabed and redistributed near or on the shore. The waves will do the rest. We should take an ecological approach, uh, try to use the forces of nature to protect the country where possible. The main area where this is really very feasible is in coastal protection. Dragging up sand from the North Sea and have the currents actually deposit that sand to extend the coastline and broaden these beaches will be a major protection. It becomes a solid and our country becomes safe without having to build dikes of meters and meters high. Now the Dutch are continually moving sand. Huge dredges pick it up, then attach themselves to pipes, some five kilometers in length. At very high pressures, sand and water are blown through the pipes to the most vulnerable stretches of coastline. Every week, the Dutch move 16 million cubic tons of sand to keep their country safe. But an even more radical project is underway for the Netherlands rivers. We used to, to have these dikes to keep the water in, in place, but now we learned we have to make uh, a places where the water can flow to in case of more water coming through the rivers. So uh, that is an enormous project uh, through the whole country for over 40 places where we have to uh, make room for the river, as we call it. The Dutch are recreating their landscape to allow rivers room to flood, but in controlled spaces. Large channels are dug out alongside rivers to create reservoirs holding overflow during seasons of heavy rainfall. A thousand hectares of land by the River Maas will be flood zones, including land given up by farmer Fons Bergmans. <coughs> the work near the Bergmans farm is led by engineer Michel Harbraken. He's working closely with Fons. In fact, his office is on the farm. <coughs> 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 
With a variety of landowners and special interests to negotiate with, it's taken over a decade to get the project started. Now, things are moving fast. The land has already been partially flooded to take pressure off the river. We started two months ago. This used to be agricultural land. They had maize, carrots, potatoes. You can see over there the last buds of the maize. The moment the farmer took his last harvest off the land, the very next day we brought in the machines and started digging up the soil. Fons Bergmans has given up 40 hectares of land to the riverworks, land farmed by his family since 1750. The farm produced a mix of crops and Fons introduced a dairy herd. Now, all that has gone. This used to be a cow shed. Yes, cows were my life. My wife always said, Marika, Choika, and that one, they come first and then it's me. That's what my wife used to say. <laughs> when the mouse project started, where can you go? I lost 40 hectares of land. Where could I go with my animals? There was nowhere else. So two years ago I got rid of the last cows. How does it feel? Rotten, there's no other word for it. We've been waiting almost 20 years for the Mars project to come here. I went to all these community meetings and you expect decisions to be made. You hear all kinds of plans, but now finally they've started carrying out the project just this year. They started digging and I saw it's time to stop. The future's done, the business is finished. It's gone. Fons is the last Bergmans to farm the land. Now he wants to take a new direction. We'll try to convert this into holiday homes and make something out of what we've got. Maybe with tourists we'll make something out of it. Isn't life what you make of it? But it may not be that easy. This is not a recreational area. You can't swim here. It's only meant for nature conservation. Now it'll flood sooner than before. At the moment, the farmland floods two or three days a year. Soon it will flood more often. But that's the point. When the waters rise, there will be more room for the Mars River so that the areas behind won't get flooded. I think it will be beautiful. The Netherlands' relationship with water is complicated. With it comes prosperity, but also destruction. The Dutch have developed a new strategy, to work with water rather than fight it. Fons Bergman suffered repeated floods in the early 90s. Now he's given up part of his farm to create a controlled flooding area. He knows how mercurial the river Maas can be. The Maas is, is, is ons leven. The Maas is our life. The Maas is, ma the Maas is Maastricht. That's what the Maas is. And, and the people who live along the riverbanks know the river Maas best. The Maas is, the Maas is emotie. The Maas is emotion, death. People have drowned here. Verdronken. There are many songs about the Maas. Very nice songs they sing in the cafes of Maastricht. 
heerlijke liedjes in de café. Hey, en tja, la, la, la. Zo gaat het dan, heerlijke liedjes. Vreugde toen we klein waren, hier allemaal. Van die klein... When I was little, we used to fish in the river. Lots of people learned to swim here as well. Ja, dus zwemmen, vreugde, die hebben heel veel leuke manieren zwemmen. Ja, dus het is een schitter. Yes, I'm proud that I was born by the Mars. Ik hoop dat ik op de Mars geboren ben. Scientist Louise Fresco says the Dutch now have an opportunity to rethink their attitudes to water. Well, the Dutch have been very complacent, of course, in, in the last couple of decades about water because the problems actually were not visible in day-to-day -day life. I think we're now moving into a situation where we're thinking again about water not only as something to be controlled, but also something uh, which is part of our environment, part of our habitat, and something we have to live with. And uh, I think we, we are very optimistic about new creativity that is generated by thinking through how in the future we will live with water. Alexander Henny is an architect with a vision for the Netherlands' new water-filled landscape. He not only lives and works on a houseboat, He's one of the country's top designers of floating houses. In fact, his practice is called aquitecture, combining his love of architecture with his love of water. This is a skill model of a design I've made for a new type of floating house. There, there's a, a concrete foundation um, which floats, which is hard to understand for most people, but because it's hollow, it's uh, lighter actually than the water surrounding it, which keeps it floating. In the lower part, which is uh, partially submerged, you have the sleeping facilities. On top of that, there's the living room, as you can see here, with the kitchen. And here's a third elevation, uh, which can be uh, filled in any way you like. It could be a studio or, uh, or a bedroom, extra bedroom. Alexander has a lifelong affinity with water. My relationship with uh, floating home started uh, as a very young boy. Um, I grew up on a houseboat on a river. In the Netherlands uh, and, and probably in other places as well, houseboats are often uh, compared with, with uh, trailers. So there was a kind of stigma uh, on my living conditions, which in a way was, was strange to me because I, I really enjoyed growing up on the water. Living on the water has something extra compared to living on the land. At least it does for me. And I know it does for a lot of people. Uh, Dutch are very connected to the water. There's also the water itself. It just has a calming effect. And in a way, it, it, it doubles your view because uh, everything you see gets reflected in the water. Jan Abercrombie owns one of the 19 floating houses in Utrecht, designed by Alexander Henny. Here in our bedroom, we are, I guess, about five feet underwater. The water level is, um, is about here. And if we look outside these windows, we uh, overlook the water surface. And it is, it's nice. It's, it's, of course, it is not attached to any other house. It stands alone. Um, it floats. So you feel when it, uh, when it is stormy, it, uh, it moves, sometimes quite a bit. If we go up to the first floor, we get to the roof terrace. It's a nice large roof terrace. We don't have a garden, but we have a lot of um, outside, as you can see. This is the factory where Alexander Henny's designs are brought to life. It's building, but not in the traditional sense. For a start, floating houses are actually built on water. Each takes an average of 12 to 13 weeks. Yeah, what, what you see lying here is, is this side of the house, and it's uh, without the, the, the uh, upper level. So they're building from step to step. Uh, first, they start with the concrete uh, pontoon, and above that, they, they built a wooden uh, structure. In every department, there are working specialists. So in this department, the specialists are from the, the walls. And in the other department, 
the only people working who are specialized in uh, making concrete hulls. Trade is brisk. There are a lot of potential clients. But there's a snag. A floating house can be simple to make. Finding a location is more difficult. Many people come to me and, and ask if, they, if I can design them a floating house. I say, yes, I can. But the, the key factor is, do you have a location? And if they don't have a location where it's possible to uh, moor their floating house, uh, then it's basically the uh, end of the story. With more water on the Dutch map, floating homes sound like the perfect solution for urban planning. But according to Alexander Henny, there won't be communities on the water anytime soon. So what's the hold-up? In my point of view, uh, many politicians are still holding back against the development of uh, floating houses and, and the combination of, of living on the water. It's a very new process which takes a lot of time and uh, it's, it's very hard to, to pass through all the laws in, in, in the Netherlands because uh, there are a lot of restrictions. Not surprisingly, perhaps, Tenaka Huizinga thinks differently. Really, I think this is a, a subject uh, where, uh, well, politicians really are the ones who are looking far ahead and uh, uh, walking uh, ahead of everybody, not uh, uh, following others, but leading the way, as, in fact, politicians should always do. You, you bump uh, into a huge wall of bureaucracy and everything has to be discussed and with this there are too many rules and regulations there's too much fear uh, which which holds it back which stops it so um, just go for it it's early days although there are at least 10,000 houseboats in the netherlands there are only a couple of hundred of these floating villas and as many again under construction there's a big demand however Altogether, half a dozen architects are now developing a further 500 floating villas. Living on the water is still for a tiny minority. The government's emphasis is to protect those on land. In the past, uh, we built dikes, and when the sea level rises, we make the dike higher. That is not the right way to face, to face this challenge. Uh, now we want to kind of build with nature. Back on the River Maas, building with nature is what engineer Michel Habrachen also wants to do. The goal of this project, this is one part of the project Grens Maas here in Limburg, is to the South Limburg. The whole point of this project is to protect the people living alongside the River Maas in southern Limburg from flooding again, like in 93 and 95. Secondly, here we're also creating a nature reserve. Uh, dat is het eerste doel. Het tweede doel is uh, het genereren van uh, natuurgebied. The Dutch have decided on a radical change to embrace the water rather than fight it. Will it work? We have developed an approach, a vision, which shows that yes, it is possible with specific, very precise, localized and regionalized actions that meet the different needs. Uh, rural areas are different from urban areas, are different from industrial areas. That approach, I think, as it will become implemented, uh, will be extremely relevant to the rest of the world. It's an approach that will work only if some are prepared to make sacrifices. Just let it come. We cannot hold it back anyway. And if it comes, we'll have to make the best of it. And that hope for that hope. And we hope, we really hope, that we will never experience this again. No more floods. Home, yeah. Yeah.